Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to another episode of the Expert to Authority show. And my name is Simone Vincenzi, and I'm your host. And this is a show for coaches, speakers, trainers who want to grow their business while making an impact in the world. And if you are new, well, welcome. Uh, you can expect different episodes each week. Sometimes we talk about uh, some of the behind the scenes of how, what do we do on a marketing and sales level or operational level in our business, GTEx. Sometimes we interview some of our clients to ask them about their successes and also what they've learned through the process. And other times we have uh, incredible guests like today uh, talking about topics that uh, can make a difference in your life and in your business or your career, like it is in this particular situation. Now, before we get started, I introduce our guest for the day. Uh, which we are going to talk about executive transitions, executive transitions, so pay close attention. But before we get started, I want to remind you about uh, our webinar conversion kit. You know that webinars are an incredible way to get clients, but to create a, a presentation that delivers value and gives you clients at the same time is not the easiest thing to do. You might have tried a couple and maybe that didn't work out as you expected. That's why we have created the webinar conversion kit, which is uh, a one-stop shop and one-stop place where you can find everything you need to create a high converting presentation and to uh, sell out your webinar. And that's for less than $30. So you can find the link at uh, here in the show notes or in the description, or you can go to webinarconversionkit.com. So it's webinarconversionkit.com. Now it is time to introduce our guest today, and when it comes out, uh, when it comes to executive transition, he speaks with an authority that is grounded uh, in research and also uh, complemented by demonstrated experience. Uh, is an ICF accredited coach education took him on a three-year journey across the continent, working with more than a hundred C-level coaching clients worldwide. He distills key insights, guidance, and coaching for maximizing leadership impact. And today, talking about how to master executive transitions, please welcome Navid Nazemian. Navid, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, Simone. Thank you so much for the invitation. I very much look forward to our conversation, and I'm pumped to talk about my topic, uh, which is transitions and executive transition. I know you recently uh, wrote a book called Mastering Executive Transitions, which anyone can find uh, the link in the show notes uh, as well in the description. Uh, but before getting into why you started writing the book uh, and uh, also practical advice that we can give to executive in transition, um, how did you get passionate about this topic? What was What got you to this point? Yes, yeah, so I guess I have, I'm biased in, in three ways. One is... You know, over the last 25 years, I have been an executive leader myself. I have been going through the ranks, uh, working for, you know, some of the most admired companies uh, on the planet. So I've always had this, you know, experience of going through transitions. And by the way, they're never easy, never, even if you transition within the same organization. Um, and I also came at the topic through the lens of my coaching. So this is, has been you know, a specialization that I have focused on early. And so, you know, I've just had the, the fortune and the privilege of working with some of the most senior leaders, um, you know, on the same topic. So, so I, I, I kind of tried to come at the topic through three different angles. And the one that's missing is that of HR. So this is where I've spent the last 20 years um, working in. So, so HR has always a particular focus and interest in making sure that leadership transitions work effectively. And uh, yeah, so that's been kind of my journey. And this is why writing the book was a bit of a no brainer for me. I really didn't have to think hard about the topic, uh, but boy, it was a lot harder than I thought to actually get to finalize and publish a book. What was the, the, the hardest thing that you didn't expect about publishing uh, the book? So I think, um, so, so what I first off uh, admire are people who take a year out, go on a lonely island and come back with two full manuscripts in their luggage, right? I admire that. I just did not have that luxury. So in between the seven years that took me from start to finish and publishing the book, I did perform in three different jobs, in three different countries, in two different companies and industries. And a year 
or shortly after starting to write the book, our son was born. So as I happen to say, you know, life just gets in the way. And so I just didn't have that gap year to go and, you know, fully focus on, on, and bring about a, a great book. Doesn't, doesn't, isn't there a parallel though with the, also a decision of an executive making a transition? Because, uh, you know, I think that in our mind, most of the time, whether we're talking about executives, but I'm looking at my journey as an entrepreneur, every time I want to make a change, I'm looking, oh, when this happened, I'm going to make this change. Or this, uh, we are looking for the right time. Uh, for you, there was not the right time to write a book and you managed to get it done. Is that this what happened also with the client that you work with uh, when they want the transition, but things get always get, seems to get in the way? Yes, yes. I mean, to come back to your initial question, you know, two or three of the hardest things for me were to, to still dedicate time to thinking and writing as I was going through these transitions, as I was supporting transition, you know, C-level leaders with their own transition mm. and obviously making time for family and all the, the other rest. So, so that was the biggest challenge. But two of the other challenges were, you know, how do I make sense of all these random thoughts and ideas that I have to make that and shape it into a compelling book. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't want to publish a white paper, I wanted to write a book. And so you need to really think hard and long about what is the red thread, what is the golden thread, as I call it, all around, um, you know, the storyline and how can you make it work for someone who is not maybe, you know, uh, an avid reader of, of, of a management book. And then the, the third and last one was really getting into developing my own framework. So it's called the double diamond framework of executive transitions. And so it really took me quite some time to settle on a model and a framework that people can go and apply because this is what I often miss with management books. Sometimes they're a great read, but you're left to do all the work yourself. Yep. So you sit down and have to develop an Excel spreadsheet and do your own stuff. I really wanted to be um, you know, a book and, and write a book that really speaks to both the kind of deep research and the scientific side of the topic, but also on the practitioner side of it, something that people can actually implement and, and embed. So that was the, the kind of third hardest part of writing the book. Uh, before we talk about the challenges of transition, I've got one more question around the book because uh, uh, we have a lot of authors uh, or aspiring authors that are listening to the show. So if someone is interested in writing a book or is almost there completing it, or they had this idea about uh, maybe potentially writing something, which is a nonfiction book, what would be the number one piece of advice that you would give them based on your experience of publishing your book? Yes. So, so what, the one thing that really transformed my writing and eventually getting to publish the book was two things. One, working with a coach, right? I mean, big surprise. No but, way. Yeah, <laughs> they <working>, held. <laughs> and I'm happy to mention his name. He's allowed me to do that. His name is uh, Eric Costa. And he's a professor at Georgetown University. And he's running this big you know, program, which is called the Creator Institute. And he helps aspiring authors to become authors. So that's just, you know, that, that really helped me because I suddenly had a structure and some accountability built mm -hmm. into what I had been doing for about six years prior to that. Yeah. So that was the number one thing that really moved the needle. And I guess the other angle that really helped me was not only to free up time to be able to write and think, you know, it's, it's a given, you need to occupy, you know, your diary with some free slot so you can actually do yeah. the work. But what really transformed my actual productivity was to do the thinking or writing on the back end of a meditation exercise. So I, you know, I really felt that I was in a, in a state of flow. And for that reason, I, I, I couldn't, you know, I, I, I had the writer's blockade, all these things that you hear about, yeah. you're sitting in front of your desk, yet there's nothing that you can write, and you're sitting there for an hour, there's still nothing that comes to your mind. You get through all of those, you know, ups and downs, but really over time, that state of mind and that, you know, mental state really helped me to be uh, very much productive and, and really seeing this to the end. Now, going uh, um, talking now about executives, because uh, you're talking about someone who has a certain level in their career, 
and uh, you know depending on where you are at in your career journey you have like in business you have different challenges that present yourself themselves so what have you found to be the biggest challenges that prevents executive to make successfully a career transition a career change yes yes so so you can look at this topic through two lenses one is what are common challenges that executives face when they go through a transition mm. and so the short answer to that is there are many <laughs> And some of them are actually stacking up at the same time. So imagine the case, and you know, I can use any, any example um, uh, for this. You know, there, there's a large organization that wants to hire a chief sales officer. I'm working with one of these right now myself. Mm -hmm. So this uh, individual has been hired from a neighboring industry, not from the exact same industry, but from an industry that is somehow related to that other industry. Uh, he, he's an external hire. And, you know, he has been promoted to the C-suite. Mm -hmm. So um, you, when you look at it, it's all one transition, but actually you get like four or five transitions stacking uh, with this particular one. The first one is the new organization challenge. So the way things get done in this new organization are so far removed from everything that this guy has experienced in his past. He used to work for large corporates. Suddenly he's working for a smallish type organization. Then there is the big promotion challenge. He has never been operating and functioning at the C-suite level. Of course, he's lucky that he's had that promotion, arguably externally. But again, that, that, with that big promotion comes big expectations. So, so that's the second challenge we see here. The third one is the corporate diplomacy challenge. Now, Simona, I don't know about you, but no HR leader will ever admit that politics exists in their organization. It's always someone else's issue. We are very kind and very you know, sure. collaborative in our company is what everyone would say. But the reality is he's going to a very tricky uh, structure because the organization is owned by the founding family and the founding family have shareholder representatives on the board of the company. So essentially they're still running the show. Yeah. And so again, it's a new construct, something that he has never experienced before. And last but not least, of course, the role didn't exist before. So he's now the newly appointed chief sales officer. And he now needs to figure out to take away some of the power and decisions from the existing CEO who has been involved for quite some time and essentially finding his own space in this new organization, in this new mm -hmm. created position. So you see how five challenges are stacking up at the same time, yeah. although technically we are talking about one appointment. So that's just one angle to look at the topic. But to come back to what I call the exponentially challenge exec, you know, in my book, I, I have dedicated an entire chapter just to this. And you can look at things like, you know, um, the lack of onboarding support or, mm -hmm. you know, a, a very basic kind of onboarding support that really works for 99% of the organization, but really is nowhere near enough for the top 1%. Yeah. Um, you look at things like CEO tenure, you know, the average of a CEO level leader staying in role is is going down and down it has been going down for like you know as, as far as you can you can measure so with that comes heightened expectations levels you know what used to be like a 10 15 year ceo tenure oftentimes is now the average is actually 5.9 years in the s p 500 mm -hmm. so 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 you know and and one out of seven ceos don't get to celebrate the third anniversary in the in the in the organization Wow. So, so you, you know, you, you, you are focused, you, you're focused on getting the right things done, but your time windows is really shrinking, you know, by the minute. Mm -hmm. You look at what uh, else gets in the way. I mean, there's the executive overwhelm. We just talked about it, multiple transitions overlapping. So, you know, the stacking of challenges is almost like you, you asked to run a marathon and you're put into a desert and there's a mountain that you need to climb on top. And by the way, the water supply is limited. Good luck, right? And so <laughs> you see how... The, oh yeah, and mind and mind the lions while you're there. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Make sure you don't make too much noise when you're running. So um, it's it's real. And again, you know, you can look at it through any angle. I mean, yeah. whether it's the increasing demands you know, I, I look at a study that was done um, um, a few years back, three years back, four years back now, 
uh, where they looked at what is the typical number of main KPIs for the sea level leader. Mm -hmm. And so that has um, increased sixfold over the last 10 years. So what typically used to be four to seven kind of KPIs for a CEO, today is oftentimes between 25 and 40. When you look at things like um, span of control, you know, one of the first, actually my first HR job was with Adidas, the sporting mm -hmm. goods company. And I have, you know, uh, a, a great admiration for the brand and for the organization. Um, back then we used to have those stand breaker roles. You know, you have like a chief commercial officer. Mm -hmm. And so the marketing guy and the sales guy and the customer operations guy and this guy and that, that woman, they all report into one person. So the CEO doesn't have to deal and get dragged into the details yeah. of those yeah. sub functions. You know, despite having the chief commercial officer despite having a chief operating officer, it's quite common that the CEO has got more than 10 direct reports. And again, everyone is calling for their attention. Everyone is asking for their time and commitment. So it really is, I mean, everything that's coming at the exec, I, I, I couldn't find a better term than saying the exponentially challenged exec. And by the way, all of this stuff is pre-pandemic. Nothing in my book, has anything to do with this global crazy two year hard pandemic that we have gone through and we, we're still not sure where we're gonna end. But one thing I would say is the hashtag the great resignation certainly hasn't made the executive's lives any easier. So that's really the only point that is new in the pandemic. But other than that, everything else that I cite is pre-pandemic. And I really wanted to write a book that applies universally and not for a two-year time period or maybe a three-year time period. It makes me think as well at the parallel that there are in the entrepreneurial field, because when you're an entrepreneur, you're an executive, like of your own organization and the, thinking about people that they wanted to, to start their own business uh, in, in the coaching on consulting space. Many of them are listening to us. You know, then you realize, okay, I need to learn about sales. I need to learn about marketing. I need to learn about product delivery. I need to learn about social media, put myself in a different context, put myself in a different environment. And we can see how the parallel, there is a real parallel in this transition. And uh, where the difference is that most of the time, if you're having a business on your own, you know, you're the one calling the shots. But if you're hired by an external company, even if you are the CEO, you know, you need to respond to the board of directors. You need to respond to the owner of the company. If there are owners, there is a board or the shareholders that are involved. So there is a, actually even way more on the line because uh, I think uh, the, you have to deal, which actually there is the question that uh, I'm, I want to ask you now. A, a big part of the challenges they come from uh, not only having people reporting to you, but also having a, 10 or dozens of other voices around you, everyone having an opinion of what you should do or what you should be doing, plus all the other people that have an opinion, but they're not saying it with their voice, they're saying it with their actions. How does a, an executive that comes into this kind of environment actually is able to navigate and trust themselves and get people on board or not get distracted by the so many inputs that it could be. Yes. So everything you have mentioned, Simone, everything is true. But it's also true that at the same time, you have a situation where the exec is actually cut off from crucial information, right? So why is that? I mean, I'm working with a CEO coaching client of mine right now. And so he's a divisional president in a large conglomerate. And they have decided to carve out the entire business that he's the president of and to do an IPO. So they want to do an initial public offering and he will be the, the CEO of, of an ex, you know, right. um, a publicly listed company. Now, because he has been announced, so essentially he's the CEO and, and the IPO is about to happen very soon. Um, you know, he and I were reflecting the other day in, in a coaching conversation. He said, you know what's very weird, Navid, now that the announcement is out, when I go into the kitchen to grab a coffee, people stop talking. Now, mind you, these are people who were quite chatty, you know, two months ago, and he, they know him well. He's been in the company for a long time. But by the, the sheer fact that he's now announced as becoming the new CEO, people are very mindful of what they share with him and what they don't. Yeah. 
And so, you know, that that's one aspect I wanted to mention. So it's true what you mentioned, but it's also true that there will be these, you know, funny um, things happening to you at the same time. So all you get to see is the dashboard. Uh, but not the, the informal conversations you had at the at the water boiler and and you know walking from the flo- you know the lift to the boardroom and so on. The other angle to what you said, which is also true, is executives at that level often get um, uh, you know advice which is often contradictory. So they go and meet with the chairman, and then they go and meet with the shareholder representative or two or three of them. And then they come back and then we sit down and they, they start to dissect what, I, what they have heard. And oftentimes they don't align. Sometimes they're completely, completely contradictory. So from be a fly on the wall, you're the new kid on the block, you know, take your time and you know, come back to me in six months with a plan of what you want to change to we have already lost a year um, of, of time with your predecessor, you better move fast. Right now, you know, how are you going to really make sense of that? So, yeah, it's uh, both of that is true. So you get contradictory, uh, well-intended advice that can oftentimes be contradictory as well. Now, I'm curious now to look more into your experience uh, because uh, you're coming from a unique position where you're not, uh, you have not learned only about doing executive transition coaching but also you've been to many transitions yourself. Without making any names, um, uh, if you don't want to, or if you're not allowed to, whatever. Um, but I'm curious to, to see what was the most difficult transition that uh, you had to go through, what was happening in that scenario, and how did you find your way out yes. in a successful way? So yeah, that's yeah. What, I, what I would love to know, because I think there is a lot to learn from there. Yes, I mean, I can speak about it because um, it's a long time ago. I was lucky in, in that, you know, this, this transition failure happened early enough in my uh, co- corporate life. So it really didn't affect so much the trajectory of my career. You know, in my book, I also talk about this. You know, executive transitions are high stakes kind of situations. You know, if you're kind of more seasoned exec and you have one failed transition, that may or may not be your last transition, right? So, so you, you really need to be mindful about that. So for me was when, when I actually moved from Adidas to GE. And so, you know, I came to Adidas as, as a mid-career kind of recruit. I had done six years in sales. My line manager was kind enough to hire me, give me a chance. I really wanted to get into HR and I had no knowledge of HR other than, you know, studying something and knowing a little bit about it. So she gave me the opportunity to come and perform in, in, a, in an HR role, in a junior HR role. And then, you know, a few years later, I got like a big promotion to come and join GE, you know, back then GE or General Electric was the uh, most valued company uh, on the planet, you know, 360,000 people, you know, huge market cap. They really had figured out how to develop their people. And a lot of the other SMP companies were stealing from GE, the second, third layer kind of, you know, execs to make them CEOs because they knew GE is probably the best management school you can have. So it's oftentimes referred to as an academy company. Like, you know, if you really want to learn by the books how to do this, then that GE back then used to be the company. You know, this is a long time ago, almost 20 years ago. So, So I came to that role and I did everything right. At least this is what I had in my mind because all of those things had made me successful, Simone. Right. So I had learned to work in two startup companies before coming to Adidas. And when I was with Adidas, uh, it was very, you know, it was almost like a family. I mean, the culture, the tribe, the uh, the openness, the, the very kind of, you know, casual atmosphere and everything was it was a great organization. But uh, GE was very different, you know. When I was invited to attend a skip level meeting with a senior exec in HR from the US, he flew in with a corporate Learjet and two bodyguards, right? And so, you know, <laughs> that, that was a different ball game. Yeah. And so I, I never, you know, adjusted properly in terms of culture and leadership. Yeah. And of course, politics got in the way. And mind you, when I talk about the top 10 reasons for executive transition failure, 
I also talk about the aggregated top three reasons, and they are people, culture, and politics. Mm. So I fell into the same trap that I described so well in my own book about 20 years ago, because I just kept doing, which is a very human thing to do. What had made me successful? I got a big promotion to come and join GE because I was really good at what I did. So I just carried on doing that. And, and how wrong I was, because you know, if you don't adapt your leadership, if you don't adapt your culture, at least to a certain degree, mm-hmm. chances are you know, you're gonna end up in what I ended up in, which was a, a complete mismatch between what I thought of the role, what the yeah. role actually was about, what the organization's expectations were of me and what I brought to it. So, and, and you know, it, it, it wouldn't surprise you to hear that within less than a year's time, I, I kind of resigned and moved on because it really didn't, didn't work out for me. Now, again, I was lucky that I was then headhunted and went and, you know, built my career in the FMCG mm-hmm. space and had an amazing career and, uh, up until today. But um, it could have been, you know, a really bad move and a really bad mistake that, you know, would mark the, yeah. the trajectory of my, of my career. Did, did that leave you any scar in your immediate role? Because um, sometimes uh, we go into a role or we do something and uh, maybe from the back of being really good at it, then we move into something else. We think we are good. Mm, We realize that we could have done way better, but then we can carry on some of the scars into or the insecurities into the next role. Did that happen or for you or what is just like, okay, I've learned my lessons. Let's move on. Yes. So it's it's both. And again, I have no problem to admit that, you know, it, that that experience didn't make me any more confident. And so, you know, when I then was headhunted and I came to the new organization, new position, it was like a number two role. Mm. Um, the, the premise was that I come in, deliver for two years or three years, and then eventually I will get promoted to the number one role in that country, in that entity. Yeah, so that was always the plan. So shortly after I joined, something like six months later, uh, my boss moved on and the organization approached me and said, would you be up for this you know, even bigger promotion? And I turned the offer down. I said, no way. I mean, you guys are crazy. You know, the idea was within a two or three year time period, I barely joined you know, six months ago. Now you're asking me to step up to this even bigger role I'm good. Thank you. And so they then started the search internally. And, you know, it was a country in the Middle East. It was not everyone's cup of tea. And so the GM asked me to step up to that role and, you know, act as a number one until they find someone else. And I was happy to do that. And so I did that for three months. And then they came back again and said, look, we have been going around we haven't really landed anyone internally that we really like and you know believe would be a great addition to this role. We have seen you acting up now for three months. We have got enough data points to suggest that you can do you this. Are a great candidate for this. And only then I accepted it. Right. So so there was this hesitation, which I'd never experienced in my entire oh, professional yeah. life before, where I, I really kind of thought hard and twice before saying yes. And you know what, Simone, maybe they would have found someone and I would have never gotten that promotion or that promotion would have been now pushed out by another three to five years. Mm. But I was happy to, to, to go in with that because I really felt it was, it was quite rushed. Yeah, the, the, was there, is a, there is a lot to say on how our experiences are making us or breaking us or giving us the extra confidence that we needed to say yes or to give us some self-doubt um, or some learning points as well of, hey, I just want to make sure that I'm the right fit for the role, not only for, for me and for my career, but also for you as a company. And they look like, it looks like that those three months gave both of you, for the company and yourself, the confidence that, okay, no, I, I can do this, I can handle it. And you had little to lose because yes. you were put in that situation. And like I said, no, yeah. <laughs> if things didn't work out, which my assumption is made you feel even more relaxed in the role uh, because there wasn't, you didn't came up with this gr- huge expectations to perform straight away. Absolutely. And let me also say this in the end, Simone, of course worked also to my benefit because I knew how desperate they were to appoint me. 
<laughs> so <if they> had <laughs> been, you managed to negotiate a good contract there. If, if they had been searching for three months without any success whatsoever, <laughs> ah, that's a good point of view. You had the upper end in the negotiation there. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's good. And uh, this has been a, a, a great, uh, a very a great conversation, talking about transition, talking about culture, talking about you know internal politics uh, and all the different elements that affect executive in the transition so we talked about your book a, a, a few times uh, um, tell us a bit more what can executive expect by buying it by opening it up by reading it what they can expect in the book yes so uh, first of all i mean i'm super humbled uh the book has just been released you know the ebook went live in december last year the paperback went live on valentine's day this year so you know six weeks ago it's a number one new release on amazon it's a bestseller on amazon I, I really had um you know high hopes for the book but i never imagined it would go you know such places so I'm, I'm really humbled by that so so the way i i really come to the book is what i described earlier so i want to you know have grounded research that is really well you know connecting the data points and at the same time, you know, I don't think there's any value in having just research without the practical element and the practicability of it. So I, I really wanted to write something that works in practice, but also speaks to people who really want to understand the numbers and the data behind. And so in my books, for instance, one of the really value adding things I do is I speak about 10 interventions, how you can make executive transitions more successful. So I really bring to it concrete steps that the exec or the organization can do in order to help them succeed. That's just one angle. And the other angle, which is you know, connected to the paperback uh, of the book, anyone who buys the paperback will get from me, um, they need to send me an email and then they will get what I called the executive transition playbook. So this is the digital companion it's a 31 page document where they can take my double diamond framework and apply it to their executive transition. So whether they are uh, an executive leader and they want to go and get some support with their transition through self-help, that's the book and the guide, whether they are a coach who happen to work with you know, leaders in transition and they want to use that tool to help the leader to reflect and focus on what's coming up and how they can best prepare themselves for it. I really have tried to give a practical angle to everything that's related to the book. Uh, I, can, I can see you covered both sides, the research and the practical side, ma making everyone happy. <laughs> trying to, trying to. Yes. All right. So you can find the link here in the show notes. Uh, uh, make sure you check it out. Uh, and um, um, there are going to be the Amazon links, the website links, and also there are going to be the uh, links to connect with Navid uh, on social media. Uh, Navid, it's been an incredible interview. I enjoyed uh, talking about executive transition, which uh, normally is not a topic which I know about or I talk about. So it definitely opened my mind to it and also it helped me realize all the parallels that there are in the entrepreneurial field and uh, the decision making points and the difficulties as well making that transition in a successful way if you were to wrap up this uh, with the conversation that we had today with uh, a final with a final thought what what would it be how would you wrap up the conversation we had today yes so i would say two things one is i really want to connect this episode also with your coaches that listen to the podcast. So there may be execs who listen to this, but I'm sure there will be plenty of coaches listening to this. And so the point I want to make is I have about a handful of affiliations with coaching providers. So they work, you know, with large corporates and whenever they got a transition topic, they reach out to me and kind of present me as one of their coaches. And then the client decides whether they want to do the work with me or not. In every one of those five affiliations, executive transitions is in the top three categories of what they sell. So, you know, there's corporations coming to them for all sorts of different topics, you know, resilience and, 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 and this and that and the other. But transitions is in the top three categories, irrespective of which organization we're looking at. So it's a really high in demand topic. And so there is value. I mean, if they want to upgrade their knowledge and upskill themselves in potentially working with transition clients, then obviously the book is a starting point and this episode will help them to get a little more 
um, into the topic. So I just wanted to, you know, uh, make it make a uh, uh, connection there between this and and how does it apply to any other coach? Yes, yeah, thank you, thing. thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that because uh, I'm sure that there are you know there is a there is always something that we can learn. There is always a distinction that you can make. Maybe you're already working, you're listening, you're already working with executives. Okay, you, what 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 extra things can you bring to the table? Do you know that you are as good as the value that you can provide to your clients and the problems that you can solve to your clients? Or maybe you're tickled by the idea. You understand that the the kind of demographic, maybe you, that was your background, and you can really help other executives. That can give a great framework. So yes, so that's one angle, and then the other angle is. If people don't take anything away from this episode and everything we have discussed so far, you know, if they are an organization or an executive leader, the number one thing they can do to support them with the transition is to go out and hire an executive transition coach. That's the most direct and simple way to support themselves with what's coming ahead. Now, I got a 50-50 split between my coaching clients. 50% of them come to me and self-funded. They're happy to you know, make the investment because they really know how crucial their career and the transitions are for them. And about 50% of them are sponsored by their organization because their organization sees the value of, of you know, investing in them. And they will do that and, and achieve two things right away. The first one is, that will reduce the so-called derailment risk. You know, 40% of all executive transitions are a failure. We know that number very well. It's very well researched. So four out of 10 execs just don't make it. Now you can reduce that by at least 50% or more. And the other ad- advantage of working with the transition coach is that you can shorten the so-called time to productivity by another 50% or more. So let's say for an external hire, it takes them between six to nine months to start paying a dividend on the original investment that the organization has made for in, you know, in them, you can reduce that to you know, by 50% or more. So again, you know, sometimes HR people struggle with um, identifying the value they bring to the organization or you know, putting numbers behind what they do. But here's a very concrete case how you can not only claim your seat at the table, but really deliver value to your organization by knowing that you know, if you have executives who are going to a transition, don't hire them a leadership development coach or a life coach. Go after the specialists who are transition experts who can help you and that leader to make the next transition successful. Well, Navid, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. It's been a great conversation. And uh, yes, specialized knowledge is what can shortcut any result. So if that's a, if the, your organization is a, in that position where you hired someone and someone is going for a transition period, then give them the support that they need, not only for them, but for you as a company. <laughs> All right. So Navid, thank you very much again. And I'm kind of wait for a part two or another conversation that we can have here on this show. And uh, until then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. If you're watching on YouTube or other platforms, thank you for listening. If you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, there is one thing, actually two things that I will ask you to do. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any other incredible episodes. My assumption is that if you have been with us until now, you've enjoyed the episode, so you will enjoy the, the other episodes that we have planned. So hit the subscribe button. And then secondly, leave us a review. Uh, reviews are the life and blood of every show we can get uh, the more reviews the better reviews the more incredible guests like navid we can have here on this show they're good for the show they're good for the for the audience they're good for everyone they're good for my ego so leave us a review and we will really appreciate it until next time always remember that together we grow exponentially ciao oh